It's a pleasure to introduce Jackie Oshiro tonight. Uh, you know, I was thinking as I was sitting there, what a pleasure it is to have so many great writers in Utah because we get to hear them so often. They come back through and every time it's a continual pleasure. And that's certainly the case with Jackie Oshiro. Um, every time I hear her read, I hear something new. I hear this great conversation that, uh, that lifts us up in its beautiful, casual uh, formality. It's amazing. And I, I, I talk to my students about her works, we read her Tetsurimas and we think, how in the hell does she do that? And you know, it sounds like she's having this conversation, but it's a conversation that lifts you to the highest levels, because often she's sort of conversing with God and trying to figure it out, what's going on? I love that, how does she do it? I don't know, but we get the pleasure of hearing her do it tonight. Um, Jackie Oshro is a professor at the University of Utah. Uh, she has a bunch of collections of poetry, including uh, most re recently, White Thorn, Hoopo's Crown, and Dead Men's Praise. Her debut collection was Looking for Angels in New York in 1988. She's been awarded the Witter Biner Prize from the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters, and several prizes from the Poetry Society of America, and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Ingram Merrill Foundation, uh, etc. Please welcome Chaplain Oshawa. Thanks, it's gotta go way lower. Uh, it's a thrill to read with Peter. Um, might get sick of that Terzarima tonight. Cause I, I just wanna read what I wanna read and it's pretty much all in Terzarima. So, I like to read, you know, the last thing I've been working on. So I'm gonna do it, you can see I made some changes <laughs> this morning, we'll see. Um, I don't think it needs any, and it's long, so it ought to explain itself. One thing, I mentioned the halfway mark in the Holland Tunnel. You know, the Holland Tunnel goes under the river between New Jersey and New York, and there's a certain place where there's a mark, and it says New Jersey on one side and New York on the other. That's the halfway mark. So this is Penn Station, 50 years gone. There must have been a train, a subway ride, but what I remember is the palace in between, its high glass walls inlaid with light. And so enticing, I thought closed in space, more open even than open air. Light, the only presence in the concourse, though I must have seen throngs of women there. Wednesdays were ladies' days on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Women paid f half fare a practice eventually declared illegal. I was three or four and rode for free. My unlucky sister stuck in school. We did this often, my mother tells me. Philly to Brooklyn in time for lunch, and then the island on Eastern Parkway where she sat with her mother on a bench while I hopped from hexagon to hexagon, examining the sidewalk inch by inch for the secret of this new compelling pattern, molecule to petaled flower to star, the quintessential feature of Brooklyn. Tightly fitted shapes nuzzling together from parkway pavement to bathroom floor. Or did my notice of such things come after, when we'd get there as a family by car, the halfway mark in the Holland Tunnel, whoever saw it first, always my sister, awarded a nickel, arrivals sentinel. Next, Liberty from the Manhattan Bridge. But even she, torch and all, could not annul that more and more impossible assemblage of wrought iron, granite, glass, and light that gave me something of a sense of pilgrimage a decade later in a window seat on Amtrak heading to a camp reunion. My friends and I had arranged to meet at the clock information booth at Penn Station, then ride together to Valley Stream. 
I'd be face to face with stored up vision. How much was memory? How much was dream? What for years conspired in me to nurture the sort of intimate, fanatic claim we make as children on what we adore. And though I didn't know the terminology, my platonic ideal of architecture, unaltered really to this very day, openness corralled and sealed with light. But on that day in autumn 1970, I got off the train to find concrete and crowds and trash and ugliness and smell. I assumed that in the interim, they'd built a slapdash addition to my beautiful, perhaps too good to use, remembered space, found my friends and convinced them all to join. Did we miss a train, my wild goose chase, until finally we asked a policeman who told us this was all there was when we asked for the main part of Penn Station. Perhaps I was thinking of Grand Central, an easy subway ride. Just go down the stairway one stop on the subway, then take a shuttle. But it was late. We had to reach Long Island before the Sabbath. We were under the spell of Jewish summer camp. So I abandoned one dream for another. Adolescents are flexible that way. And our weekend, demanding, fraught, intense, turned my confusion at Penn Station into a funny story. Its disappointments postponed for the weekend's brief duration. But on my train ride home, an acrid taste pervaded everything. My initiation into the recalcitrant mistrust with which a bossy, non-compliant present infiltrates and redesigns the past. Still, I was, after all, an adolescent. I had a world to change, a war to end, and though I knew my vision wasn't of any other station, I abandoned my newly upended memory, though I would have liked to understand where it had come from, perhaps TV? But my childhood TV was black and white. And I could see pink stone against a shimmery, golden yellow amplitude of light extending in every known direction. Only years later, as an undergraduate, when the fate of Grand Central Station, thanks to my namesake, Jackie O's publicity, became a topic of dinner conversation, did I finally unravel my old mystery. Jackie's war cry was the demolition of Penn Station in 1963. Thunderstruck, I stopped the conversation, grabbed hold of someone's newspaper, hoping for a photo of that Penn Station, but there wasn't one. Just words like treasure, masterpiece, sorry, treasure, irreplaceable, masterpiece. And though I felt in part like a traitor, how easily I'd let go of my memories, I also felt the balm of absolution. I haven't earned all that many victories, perhaps only this once, over oblivion. My light-struck little girl had not been wrong. Her newly proven memory, a safe haven for the world's lost treasure. All along, there's no overstating the world's recklessness with what's irreplaceable in her safekeeping and, or so it seemed, nowhere else. She and I, the keepers of Penn Station, along with any other now-grown girls, also given to infatuation as they trailed their mothers on ladies' days. Still, this belated restitution of my too easily forsaken memories was, at best, a pyrrhic victory. My palace lost, this time without a trace. Though I did have sightings, an illusory 35 millimeter meteor flashing by me in the Palm Beach story. Wasn't that the real, the seven year itch, spellbound strangers on a train? I'm speaking of the glory days before VCRs and DVDs, when you took in a movie all at once, no rewind, no pause, and then 
a find in a remainder's bin, midtown Manhattan, perhaps Brentano's, as I flipped through the pages of a cast-off coffee table book of New York photos, wrought iron, stone and glass, possessed by something more like sorcery than sun. An image, I suspect, has long replaced, or perhaps just merged with, my childhood vision. Berenice Abbott, Penn Station Interior. Take a look, reader. It's online. Perhaps I should have told you this before. You can even buy a print, an aura magical enough to turn a person, even at four, especially at four, elegiacal for at least another half century, which explains why I have an almost physical attraction to train stations. My history insists upon it. The more whimsical, over-the-top, absurd, unnecessary, the more I love them. Antwerpen Central, Siebold Austerlitz, Milan, on St. Pancras. Forgive me, <clears throat> but for all its grace, Grand Central doesn't have the lushness to redress what turns out to be my great childhood loss. The place, after all, is steeped in darkness. Too much travertine, too little glass. And yet, reader, I still thrill to go there, famished as I am for any trace of the notion that arrival or departure, any ones at all, is apt occasion for unstinting outpourings of grandeur. And there it is, reader. It's not Penn Station Interior by Berenice Abbott, I see, but an entire universe's concentration on the daunting task of welcoming me, Jackie, after my first ride on a train, which, oh, how memory breeds memory, must have had a caboose on it, a little red one, like the one in the story in the Golden Book my mother sure, surely read me on that train. We'd always watch for the caboose when we were stuck at a railway crossing. Here it comes, look. For a minute, I imagined she walked me back to see the caboose on our train in New York, but only freight trains had cabooses. Wrong again. Oh, reader, forgive me. The nostalgic wasn't my intended destination. But what can I do? I've been derailed. I wanted to tell you about Penn Station. So magical a place, even a child would claim it as her private secret palace. How I once inhabited a world so benevolent, a, its public space seemed to cherish every human being. I honestly haven't thought of that caboose for nearly 50 years. It wasn't among the golden books I read to my own children. Perhaps they didn't reprint it. I wasn't expecting to be blindsided by my mother all of a sudden. The way she made us each her magnum opus. I remember it as my secret that Penn Station was my private palace. I didn't confess anything to her about my treasure. But she had the habit of making a fuss over what she thought might bring us pleasure. I wonder if I've done that for my girls. The world's a different world. One can't measure one against the other. Still, it's marvels, or some of them. Which ones may be elusive? Who knows, in 50 years, which hazy miracles my girls will half recall, half try to prove, until some chance event puts one in focus. Something wonderful they've had a glimpse of that I likely see as commonplace, but with which I'm somehow intertwined. Just let it be wide open and gratuitous, evocative of something like the kind of, what should I call it, solicitude, that made me think the world had been designed with me alone in mind. My childhood, a festival of wonders, with each fresh thing, a stray leaf clinging to a piece of fruit, a twin yolk in an egg, a cardinal idling in our neighbor's birdbath, my mother's voice. So urgent and excited, we'd come running. Back from the laundry, a pillowcase with a tiny Chinese character inside its hem was bounty from an ever-brimming universe with a prize like Cracker Jack in every item. 
No doubt it was she who pointed out the way Penn Station's granite walls would gleam in all that captured, concentrated light. The roof of windows letting in the skies, wide open pathways, the infinite, just one among a host of possibilities, awaiting every traveler prepared to greet her sliver of the earth with open eyes. Uh, all right, well, I'll read one sonnet in between these terzarimas. So this is Dusk in January, Salt Lake City. In a fallow season, the smallest change offers up a momentary lifeline. Tonight, it's the mountain's rose reflection of whatever gives the sky this neon tinge, muted by a pale stockpile of snow. The air itself is rose. I'm breathing rose, trying on the mountain's rose disguise, even as the sky goes inky blue around two outsized wings loping toward me, gangly, but for a slow motion of grace. Down, up, down, up, deliberate, steady, completely noiseless, though they come so close, I half believe I've caught the owl's wild eye as he scans the landscape for easy prey. And then I'm just gonna read one more poem, but it is not short. Um, uh, I like to, I see it as a kind of, as in conversation with that last poem I read. I hope it's not merely repetition. Uh, I wanna read it tonight. I did read it at my last reading here, but my father passed away two weeks ago, so I would like to read this poem. Uh, let's call it Eclipses of the Moon. They say there's no trusting memory, but where else could I have acquired this red moon-shaped blur against a deep black sky, simultaneously vague and vivid, this cryptic language on my father's lips? I'm in a blanket in his arms, snatched from bed. Lunar eclipse, he's saying, lunar eclipse, guiding my still half-asleep gaze upward until just beyond his pointing fingertips, something red elaborates each word. Lunar means moon, I hear him say. Or am I just infusing what I heard with all his later lessons in vocabulary? Eclipse covered by the Earth's shadow, all incomprehensible to me. What could it mean, the Earth's shadow? And how would it reach across the sky? There's nothing of the telltale crescendo or decrescendo, the essential quality I'll learn of an eclipse. It's instantaneous. I'm in a blanket. My father's holding me and pointing to the sky. I hear his voice. It's the middle of the night and we're outside. The sky's red blur almost extraneous, except that only it could ever provide the occasion for such an outsized memory. Could there be a luckier child than the one whose father, even when she's three, can't bear for her to miss something wonderful? It must have been March 13th, 1960. I searched for total lunar eclipses visible from Philadelphia. There's no red glare if the lunar eclipse isn't total. I was eight before the next one would occur, and by then didn't need eclipse defined. There'd been a solar eclipse the year before, when I was so afraid of going blind, I wouldn't even approach a curtained window until I knew danger was at an end. But the moon's eclipse is pure bravado on the heavens part, at its most emphatic and innocuous one night only show and more of a celestial practical joke than anything else when it isn't, when it's just partial. I can remember doing a double take at a crescent moon. Wasn't the moon just full? On the last night of camp, we'd stayed awake all night, already mourning our magical utopian respite on the lake from a world we loathed for its conformity. This was precisely one year after Woodstock, 
August 17, 1970, a partial eclipse visible from New England, two days after my 14th birthday. And I was the sort of adolescent, a would-be poet in the age of Aquarius, who cared if the moon was full or crescent, regarding more or less the entire universe as a personal communique to me. Ecstatic when, an hour before sunrise, the moon was full again, and dormant memory, a blanket, my father pointing to the sky, his voice saying eclipse came surging back to me, as it did last night, though it was cloudy, and I couldn't see the promised eclipse at all. Instead, that vague red blur against the sky, a moon from full to crescent back to full, one atop the other like an overlay, transparent in a textbook against the dull, low-hanging, heavy winter gray. Fifty years since that full, forty since that partial, the only eclipses of the moon that I have managed in all these years to see. Though I did point my daughters toward the sky on numerous occasions, most recently, it was near my birthday, so they humored me, the most spectacular Perseids in decades. All three drove up the canyon with me, lay on a ratty blanket, tilted back their heads, and even joined my ecstatic oohs and ahs without irony for once. Motherhoods, for me, become a matter more or less of providing fodder for jokes, at least they're funny. When one atop the other, simultaneous twin meteors expended on the sky, their incandescent one-time only banners so fleeting and improbable that I wouldn't have believed without my daughters. I'd seen what I had seen, almost a proof that there exists a music of the spheres. What other music could have carried off that thrillingly unlikely pas de deux? So indelible that if I live long enough to outlast, as my father has, lucidity, his answer to every question, ask Evelyn, those twin shooting stars will single-handedly intercept my mind's spreading oblivion with their evanescent double arc. That's what he says to me. Ask Evelyn, or sometimes ask my wife. It's too much work for him to remember she's my mother. Some connective apparatus has gone dark. But he does know that he's my father. His face, when he sees me, something splendid. His expression now, an open bellwether of what is going on inside his head. And it's infectious, that perfect joy. So I feel it too, however mitigated, would almost welcome this endearing envoy from my prehistory, this left field chance to know my father as a little boy, if it weren't so absurdly out of sequence, so heartbreakingly immutable. Besides, he always had a kind of innocence, marveled at a world he saw as full of endless opportunities for wonder. And though a bit afraid of the natural, a true city kid more at home with cinder blocks and cement than trees and grass, was always after showing us the splendor of this magical, if deadly, universe. Though he took no chances, preferred his ocean from the undertow-free vantage point of shores, every excursion and occasion for still more lessons in vocabulary. At the ocean, for example, horizon, the line where the ocean meets the sky, confounded me summer after summer. I saw no line or even opportunity for a rendezvous of water and air, though I was enthralled by the idea. And then when I was, what, in junior high school, he began stuffing me with words he'd circle in every article of Time magazine, zenith, probity, clandestine, assiduous, apocryphal. Even now, certain words I come across, regardless of their context, will still assert themselves in my father's voice, juxtapose, harbinger, alacrity. I've passed them on to my daughters, their ACE, SAT scores, my father's legacy. 
Why not try his game on him? What's largesse, Daddy? Generosity. He barely skips a beat. Opprobrium? Public disgrace. Abjure? Abstain. Each precise, well-chosen synonym, a perfect marvel of illumination in an otherwise unbroken spell of shadow. It's as if I found a pristine lexicon in the rubble of an earthquake or tornado, every other household item lost. Unless my father, incommunicado and not manifestly at his best, is still himself in there somewhere. Perhaps his mind's just resting, a palimpsest in the hiatus between manuscripts, the first rubbed out, the second not yet written. Who ever heard of an eclipse wholly immune to orbit or rotation, moving straight from partial into full? Meanwhile, word and definition, twin meteors, tail on top of tail, interrupt the darkness in unison, and I'm the witness daughter in their thrall. All of memory, the fleeting outline of that split second interregnum between the obscure and the uncertain. From my first foray into nighttime, a blanket, my father's arms, cold air, his finger pointing to something dim, to this articulate beseeching blur, suspended as the meteors take aim, reconfiguring my father's stare as Earth's long shadow eclipses him. Thank you.